Oh, here comes Kathleen. That's terrific. Yeah. Yeah. Eden's a great partnership. Hi, Kathleen. And I saw the message that you are recording it. Yes, it, and uh, I think Kathleen. We'll we'll check with Kathleen. Uh, right. She mentioned there might be some constraints about how that how that gets used, but right. we haven't closed on that. Hi, Pat. It's Kathleen. Thank you so much for orchestrating this. Where people are piling in here right now. So. Oh, good. Well, thank I don't you. have my settings. I, I haven't been clever enough to go back and admit uh, and change uh, pre-scheduled uh, meetings so that they don't have a waiting room that you have to let people in on. So, yet another thing about Zoom, I'm not uh, adept at. <laughs> well, hey Pat, be careful because I tried to get all of our members to sign up on ours. Yeah. And what it does, it disables their own personal account. Oh, dear. And so they had to go back and reapply for their account, which gives them a different account number. It was, Yikes. it's buried in the Zoom information. It doesn't tell you that up front. Well, thanks for the heads up. Yeah. Uh, we have Dr. Curry on the line. Hi, Dr. Curry. Oh, good, good morning, morning everybody. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. We're just of delighted course. to be able to do this. Oh. Gary, as soon as you're uh, uh, as you're able, can do, would you like me when we get to that point? Uh, Kathleen had asked if one of us would introduce uh, Pat Ryan, and I I have the the page that that Kathleen linked me to. But if you would like to make a more personal introduction, since you're Castro Valley Valley uh, people, then feel free to. Well. I I think you know, you've got the information probably more than I do about her, but you know, okay. I would be happy to make a couple of comments at some point about the, the partnership between Eden and Castro Valley Rotary. Which... Well, why don't we kick off with that once we have a quorum then? And uh, why don't we lead with that? Because uh, I, I just think that's so important. I was so excited when we talked about this, this <laughs> global grant in the early stages and you talked about the relationship with Eden and, and your club and the community. So. Yeah, Kathleen's on here right now, so she's yep. been a big part of that. We were, yeah. she's our one of our main points of contact there, so she's a huge help. You have friends, Kathleen. <laughs> Gary, did you get my email about my availability tomorrow? Uh, yes. Yeah, I should be able to get there by. <laughs> But I had a client district go south on some problems that I need to deal with. Well, one thing I like uh, uh, about, uh, I, I continue to be amazed, and maybe I shouldn't be, is uh, often at Rotary events, people come early. <laughs> I've had to caution a few, a few people who are leading meetings to not start them before the appointed time, unless yep. you know that everybody that's going to come is there, that that's, it's good that people are eager, but uh, uh, I worked at an organization where there was sort of a 10 minute rule and then, then one would start, but uh, others have different, uh, different etiquette. You know, it's certainly at our lunch meetings, people tend to show up right on the moment or within a couple of minutes after they're pretty good about <laughs> it, but they don't well, get there too early. <laughs> yeah. The other thing is we get 20 to 22 registrations and 35 people in the meeting. <laughs> which, which is no problem on which is a Zoom call. Yeah. But for a lunch meeting where we cater the meals, it's a bit of a problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I haven't had to deal with that at all this year. No, you're lucky. And that's never... it's been... Uh... It's presented its own meeting. benefits and, and challenges, that's for sure. Morning, Merlene. Morning. Good morning, Todd. Good morning. You in the snow? Just below it. Okay. And we have um, Dr. Ao and Dr. Terrence Lynn on, on as well. Wonderful. And I see Pat is connecting.
<clears throat> should also point out that on the call here is Carolyn Siegfried. She's the president of the Livermore Rotary Club. So, and a good partner of ours. And uh, she was also a big part of this grant. So Carolyn, glad to see you this morning. Thank you. Here's Pat. Thank you. Thank glad you, to be here. For being here. Yeah, we can give it just a few more minutes uh, to see who else comes up. Uh, I just am really excited to be able to have as many of our Rotary team hear from the Eden team as we can, but I want to be sensitive to people's time. Um, Jill's joining us now. Jill Durig is our assistant governor for Area 4 this season, uh, this Rotary year, as well as uh, being a Jill mainstay uh, going forward. There so. she is. Good morning, Jill. How are you? <laughs> We're always happy to have Jill. <laughs> I don't know that everybody would agree with that, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> well, we in Livermore agree. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. It's good to see everybody. Thanks for joining us, Jill. <laughs> I was joking, Jill, that one thing about uh, rotary meetings is often people are early. And so, you know, I kind of have to remind myself not to not to get rolling <laughs> before the appointed time or a few minutes after uh, to allow a little more time for people to come in. And that's appreciated, especially by people who have back to back meetings and they're ducking out of one to go to the next. <laughs> Yeah, I actually had a colleague, uh, one of the other hats I wear in addition to Rotary is Engineers Without Borders. And the, I noticed that he'd set a meeting from on the hour till 10 minutes before the next hour. And he said he was doing that on purpose to allow for the, to avoid these back-to-back -back sort of sessions. Um, Kathleen, I was just going to double check. I, as I'm looking at the participants here, I didn't see... Uh, Pat Ryan on the, that's Ryan PM up near the top. Yeah, so I see now, okay. <laughs> oh, we're still having people come in. I have not been clever enough, as I mentioned to some of you. I, I, actually, this, this week's Doonesbury in the, in the Cron was all about this season of, of, of Zoom events and, and the indignities we've all suffered in Zoom sessions. Uh, but uh, I haven't figured out how to uh, reset uh, my meetings, some of which have been standing for a while so that I don't have to have a waiting room. And uh, people have explained this to me, but with some cautions, Jim was mentioning one of them. So I... Uh, I have to kind of watch this or get a co-host to uh, help watch to let people in so that we don't hold up the show. Well, I want to be sensitive to people's time. Uh, it's all it's coming up on five minutes past the hour, I think. And so what I would suggest is why don't we uh, we go ahead and get started. I'll continue to let people come in, but I know that uh, people at Eden are busy. I really respect that. And thank you very much for making time um, I think some of you, uh, Jim indicated, you certainly can't read the fine print, uh, but you can see that my background, uh, virtual background, shows that this, this is a big deal for us in Rotary. Uh, our Area 4 clubs were able to put together a global grant to provide what was most requested by the healthcare providers. We wished we could have do, done more, but uh, being able to do almost 100K of uh, rotary funding into our communities uh, is important to us. And it turns out we were able to serve a healthcare provider in each of the communities where our clubs are based. And so with that, I wanted to give Gary a, a little bit of an opportunity to uh, describe a bit the context uh, uh, and the relationship with Eden when we started putting this together and we were looking for who those community healthcare providers were, Gary said, well, what about Eden? And, uh, and here we are. <laughs> so go ahead, Gary, and then we can take it from there. And I see Glenn Kubiak has just joined us. Welcome, Glenn. Yeah, thanks, Pat. Uh, yeah, we're very happy with the partnership that we have with uh, Eden Medical Center. You know, it's one of the large uh, medical providers here in Canada. It is the uh, 
it's the only basically large, certainly the large provider here in Castro Valley. And so uh, many people get their health services there. And uh, we're doubly happy because Eden is a corporate member of the Rotary Club of Castro Valley. And that partnership has been really wonderful over the last couple of years. Um, it's worked both ways, in fact. I think this is an example that we're hearing about today where Rotary has contributed a bit to, to um, Eden Medical Center. We had a really great uh, effort that we did last year where we raised uh, quite a bit of money to support uh, an exoskeleton, what I'll call an exoskeleton device for uh, Eden Medical Center. And uh, they gave us a really spectacular demonstration of that a few months ago. I don't think there was a dry eye in the room after seeing uh, the patient walking with that device. It really uh, was quite touching. So uh, we're happy to be a part of this project. Uh, it was very fortunate uh, the Rotary International aimed its funds this year, its global funds at COVID rather than at its normal things of overseas. They doubled our uh, request. Um, that was even better, made it even sweeter. So um, once again, we're really happy. Uh, it, also, I should point out Eden Medical Center has helped us a lot with our own projects here in the community. They've been a great contributor. So thanks very much to you guys for that. So um, we look forward to that continuing in the future. So thanks to the physicians for coming in today and being willing to demonstrate and talk about the uh, nasal cannulas that were purchased with the grant money. I think uh, really looking forward to hearing all about that. And finally, I would like to say a couple of words. One is that uh, we didn't do this by ourselves. We had our area for uh, other clubs helping us with this grant. Carolyn Siegfried there, the president of the Livermore Club is here with us and was a big part of the, even with this Eden grant, made a, Livermore made a substantial contribution to it. Thanks to Jill for keeping us all herded together. And thanks in particular to Pat Coyle for writing the grant and uh, cracking the whip and keeping us all uh, focused on getting this done in sort of world record time. I was amazed that we were able to do this this quickly. So thanks, Pat, and I'll turn it back to you to let you introduce the rest of our guests. Well, thank you very much, Gary. And I, I would just say the same thing. This is an unusual thing, and we hope we never have the, the a COVID-19 experience like this again, a pandemic, where the Rotary Foundation relaxed the rules, and they allowed us to put together this grant with essentially uh, with, with zero funds from an international partner. Uh, that has since been um, changed again and they're back to a more normal kind of a way, but we had our club at Livermore had been partnering with the, uh, the E-Rotary Club of Lake Atitlan in, in Guatemala on a food security project. And, and based on that, they were willing to be our, our international partner for what amounts to a reverse global grant in our own communities. But with that, let me go ahead and introduce Pat Ryan. Pat, I'm so glad you could join us. And I'm just going to say a few things from the bio that, that Kathleen linked to us uh, uh, and then let you take it from there. But, you know, you've been around the block here. Uh, you know, the bio says you've held leadership positions for Princeton Healthcare in New Jersey, Mainline Health System in Pennsylvania, and uh, other locations as well with a BS uh, in social work and a master's degree in health administration from Penn State. So I'm not gonna take any more of your time, Pat. Please take it from there and, and take us through the team. Thank you, uh, Pat, and thank you, Gary. I think the color of my hair uh, also points out I've been around the block and uh, the block, the last corner I turned was coming to California. I had lived out here in Chico back in the early 90s, and I realized how nice it was not to have snow and freezing rain. And so I embarked after 2009, five blizzards to get back out here. And I landed at Sutter uh, and was with them for six years, uh, went down to O'Connor Hospital for three, and I'm pleased to be back here uh, in Eden and Castro Valley. Uh, what a community, what a hospital. Um, it really is uh, a, a treasure for me uh, to work here and to be in this community. So uh, thank you. We're, we're pleased to be part of this uh, Rotary community as well, and we'll continue our efforts. Uh, I will say this to you that, um, and I think everybody can say this, that we've not dealt with anything 
like a pandemic before, even with all of our experience. And what it has done is really uh, challenged us uh, both from a clinical care standpoint in terms of what the heck are we dealing with? What is it going to do to our patients? How do we keep them from getting it? And then if they do have it, are they going to stroke? Are they going to have heart problems? Are they going to have lung problems? And um, we're still struggling at times. Uh, we have had a, a resurgence of patients uh, post the Thanksgiving and I would say Christmas holidays. Uh, we reached our all-time high of 55 inpatients at one time. And if you look at other hospitals, they certainly have had more. And I'm not making light of that at all. But that's really half our census because after you take out our OB beds, uh, we're really about a 114 bed hospital. And uh, it uh, was uh, ha and has been a struggle. Your donation with the high flow oxygen units has been terrifically supportive of us and what we need to do. And I'm not even going to touch the science of it, explain how it's used. We have Dr. Chris Carey here, uh, who's our medical director of respiratory therapy, and she's a pulmonologist by background. But just to give you, before I hand it over to her, um, we have seen about 660 inpatients come through this hospital who have been inpatients. That doesn't include the number that we have seen and uh, taken care of in our ED and sent home who were not sick enough for inpatient. And uh, basically, our patients can go from being walking into the ED to then uh, put on a ventilator within a couple hours and up to the floor in ICU. That's how fast this can take off. And uh, it is uh, very, very depressing when you do see people social gathering. And then you see here what our physicians and our nursing staff and our respiratory therapists and all of our staff handle. Uh, because uh, they too have been put at risk with taking care of this. So everything you do, I'm going to put my plug in <laughs> to socially distance, to use your masks, wash your hands is greatly appreciated by us. And I am glad you're doing it to stay healthy and to stay away from this pretty much uh, nasty, devastating uh, illness. Um, so what this also has done, the lovely COVID, is put a huge strain on our economics of the hospital. So yes, we've received CARES Act funding from the federal government. Yes, uh, Medicare has tweaked um, uh, some of the payments that we get, but uh, we still have lost a considerable amount of money as a system. We're still in the red to the tune of over $300 million for last year alone. And uh, while every little bit helps from the, the federal government, it uh, isn't enough. And so what that does too is it puts a strain on our ability to fund capital projects, projects for $5,000 and greater. So if we don't have the cash flow coming in to support those things, philanthropy, grant writing, donations, we are so much more dependent on and thankful for. And um, this has been a, a huge help to our respiratory therapists, to our physicians and our nurses. It has helped uh, stave off some patients going on ventilators uh, and it ha has helped us um, as we step them off a ventilator, um, take good care of them. These units are not easy to find either. I think there's been a high demand in the market and a short supply. Does that sound familiar? Same thing with vaccines, same thing, you name it. So your intervention with the funds at the time you helped us, um, has helped us tremendously in this surge. I hope there's not another surge, uh, but if there is, um, we have these units and it's been uh, awesome. So without further ado, um, I'm gonna hand over to Dr. Chris Curry. And uh, I see my respiratory therapist and my director of ICU up there too with Kathleen. So Chris, take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Pat, that, that uh, boy, everything you said resonates, I think, with all of us on some level. And uh, in, you know, at Eden, they've been hit hard, just like a lot of other places. And through Pat and Veronique's uh, leadership, have done very, very well on uh, securing everything we need, making sure that the, the providers have the tools as, as best we can. If they're available, they get them for us. 
And this is just another example of making that happen. So I, I want to, to give everybody a little background on what high flow is and, and how it fits into what we do and how we care for these patients. And uh, thank you, uh, uh, Sean and Michael, for being our lovely Vannas to show us <laughs> what's, what's up there, turning our machines on. Um, but this particular unit is, uh, the brand is, I believe, uh, the Vapotherm pr uh, Precision. And um, it is one of several different vendors that provide an apparatus that we can supply high levels of oxygen to patients who have respiratory illness without putting them on life support machines or a mechanical machine that's invasive. Um, and if I'm oversimplifying, I apologize, but it's always good just that everybody understands the, the various levels of respiratory support so that you can put this in context. If somebody um, you know, it has pneumonia and it's, they're not that sick, they need to come in the hospital and maybe just be admitted to a general medical floor, they may need some extra oxygen and, and that more often than not supplied what we call a simple nasal cannula. And the flow rates on that can go up to about six liters and the amount of oxygen that you can deliver in, with that modality is probably up about 35, 40% at the highest room air being 21%. There are other types of face masks and, and non-invasive um, apparatus that we can deliver more oxygen with the one that I think many people are familiar with called BiPAP, where you have a, a mask that goes over usually the nose and the mouth, or in some cases, what we call a total face mask. It's like an entire, covers the entire face you can start to approach levels of 100% oxygen delivery for people who really are, are very, very ill. And um, it goes along with a pressure system. So you have this face mask on, you're getting a, a high flow of oxygen, but it's also pressurized. And that pressure helps augment the oxygen effect, basically. So you can approximate reasonably well the amount of oxygen you would deliver through an invasive tube down the throat life support machine with the BiPAP. But as you can imagine, especially if you're on a total face mask and on very high levels of pressure, that's really uncomfortable. You've got it blowing in your eyeballs. It's you know somewhat humidified, but not entirely. And, it, and the mask is covered. A lot of people feel very uncomfortable. You can't talk, you can't eat. And it's just a very difficult modality. It can save your life and bridge you, but it's, if you need that support for any considerable amount of time, it limits what we're able to do as far as nutrition and medication administration and those sort of things. Most importantly, patient comfort. So high flow is something that I, I believe originally came into the neonatal uh, respiratory support community and then has been expanded over the years into the adult world. But it is an amazing system where you can basically get pretty darn close to 100% oxygen deep into the lungs um, by a, a very uh, unique humidification system that warms the air and humidifies it completely so that you can deliver flow rates that are in the 60 liter, usually we're gonna max out around 60 liters per minute. Uh, as opposed to, I mentioned before, the little cannula that's you know six liters per minute. So it's a very different level. And by that humidification, it can be delivered at these high rates, which are more in line with the natural flow rate that the patient requires because they're having respiratory difficulty, they're breathing fast, and if you're only giving them 10 liters per minute, they want 60 liters per minute, they're bringing room air in, and so you drop the concentration of oxygen. This unit avoids that. And so you can, with a simple cannula apparatus, get all of that oxygen in. Because it's humidified, it doesn't dry out the respiratory tract and cause damage that way. 
if people have a lot of mucus and that kind of thing, it doesn't dry it up and plug it and make it hard for them to breathe. They can still clear uh, nicely and they can be on very high levels of support, almost the same you would have on a ventilator, but they can take medicine, they can talk, they can eat. The, the, the patient satisfaction and comfort is so much better, so much better. And by not putting them on an invasive apparatus, such as the ventilator with the, the endotracheal tube, you cut down on complication rates. Because once you start invading the natural environment with, with artificial uh, tubes and things, you set people up for infection and tissue breakdown. And when you're on a full ventilator, it also, the ventilator's doing the work, your muscles get weak. So we all, in the IC way, the longer you're on the ventilator, the longer you're on the ventilator, because it takes all of the work and responsibility of your own respiratory system, essentially away. And just like any muscle, you don't use it, you lose it. And so these poor people who are requiring that level of support for a long time end up being in the ICU a lot longer, higher risk of complication, and you know further problems down the line. It's going to take them to, a lot longer to get back to their life again. So this this apparatus is is a life support apparatus, really, but it it was beyond that. It saves people from a lot of complications reduces uh, you know, their discomfort, and actually, in many cases, will reduce the cost of the entirety of the stay in the hospital. We've avoided intubations uh, in, in many cases by having this kind of equipment available. So we could not be more grateful for what the Rotary has provided to us because we know frontline this has saved a lot of patients' lives and made their journey through this horrible disease much more manageable and got them home to their loved ones sooner. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And maybe Michael, would you be able to demonstrate the use, maybe show, show what it looks like, what the numbers are and talk through a little bit of the mechanics there? Uh, if I can turn it on, I could. <laughs> <laughs> that's not instilling the confidence we were hoping for yeah, right. <laughs> no really he he does this all the time just usually in an icu bedroom not in sean's office <laughs> a little different there and i don't I, and an well we're waiting uh, for sean to get set up i just also wanted to give a big shout out to both jeff youngsma who who made that remark as well as glenn kubiak who were both critical editors uh in finalizing the and wordsmithing the grant application that we ultimately submitted which was a big help in making sure that it was as good as we could make it when it went into the rotary foundation so thanks guys mm -hmm. All right, looks like we've got something operational here. Are you able to see the numbers? Yeah, I think we can see the numbers. They're, they're small, but we'll get a little closer here. And there we go. Okay. <clears throat> so once again, I'd like to thank you all for <clears throat> providing these machines for us. There's something that uh, we desperately needed. Uh, people come in. Our alternatives were to put them on a ventilator or use another oxygen device. And this has allowed us, like Dr. Curry said, to keep the, the patients, some of these patients off of ventilators. And it's really made a difference in our, in our uh, therapy. So one of the things when we set this up and we put it on a patient, we're able to deliver an exact oxygen flow. We're able to deliver an exact oxygen percentage. Whereas other oxygen devices, like she was talking about, the nasal cannula or a mask, uh, may provide a, a range of oxygen percentage, but mm -hmm. precise. Uh, this one, we're able to, uh, like she said, warm the oxygen uh, before it's delivered. And um, we can take this up to, uh, this machine will go to 40 liters and 100%. Uh, it's been very valuable, like we said, in keeping people off of ventilators. And 
Um, it sets up the, there's a bunch of equipment here with a, with a tubing that goes down to the nasal cannula. Uh, there's uh, there's uh, water that we hang from up here. The water runs down through the machine. The machine heats it. It runs through the tubing to the nasal cannula that's on the patient's face. Uh, and then runs back through the machine and just recycles. So, uh, like I said, been very valuable. Does anybody have any questions? Anything I can answer about the machine? Now, just a comment that uh, this hooks into our master oxygen tank, correct? Right, uh, yeah, the tubing it, it hooks into oxygen and air outlet, that's how we deliver the exact oxygen percentage. Some people not familiar may be like, okay, where's that oxygen tank? Uh, but it hooks into the wall, the wall, which yeah, has- in, have little plugs that hook into the wall. Each room have these outlets and uh, we just wheel it in, plug it into the wall, hook it into the electrical outlet, hook up, hook up these and it's ready to go in about five minutes. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So is it is it delivered like a typical tube that you see that comes kind of over your ears and up underneath your nose with the two little outlets on it? Is that kind of how that's delivered? Correct. Exactly. Okay. And the caliber of the tube is a little larger than the simple ones that you may see people out in public wearing. So it's just a little bit to accommodate that low rate, but not much, not much. Do you have trouble with... Um, some of the moisture condensing in those tubes between the machine and the and the patient or is that you know no, the not, ambient not really. temperature is warm enough that it's not a problem yeah it doesn't really condense that much and it's not really a problem for the patient yeah the, the design of the system with the hum heated humidification there's sort of an external within the tubing of the cannula that that water is running continuously around um, and heating, so you really don't get rain out, which is that condensation that you know you will see on like, our ventilators. You know the therapists are constantly having to change the tubing because it does condense and, and rain out. But we really the the design of this is quite amazing, where there's very little of that. You know, there is a question in the chat. There's a couple actually. One is how many units does Eden have? I think we bought three, but you might have more of those. Yeah, what? Um, yeah, I believe we have four now. We have another unit. There's a couple other types that of units. One's called the B60, which is a is a ventilator that can kind of kind of does a little bit of everything. It can do high flow, it can do mechanical ventilation with the tube, it can do BiPAP. So we can also interface those with patients. And I, I don't know off the top of my head how many we own on that front. So I'd have to, uh, maybe Michael or Sean, you could speak to the, the number of, of machines that can do this kind of thing. Two more of that will do that. You know. Can't hear you guys. <laughs> Kathleen, you're on mute. So the question is how many of these high flow units and or units uh, do we have, if not specific, these that can support the need for high flow oxygen? Yeah, like uh, Dr. Green mentioned, um, we have a couple of device activations that actually- Not, not able to hear you, Sean. So you can't hear me? How's yeah, that? so maybe get a little closer. Yeah. It's better? Yes. yes. All right, so we have uh, B60 devices like Dr. Green was alluding to. Oh, uh, lost you again. Sorry, I'm sorry. We lost you. I don't know you. if it's just, are you there? There you yeah, go. Yeah, now yeah, I think you have to stay that close and. Okay, so um, we have the V60s that Dr. Curry had just alluded to. Um, and these are different. These are BiPAP devices that have dual capability. And we have four of those devices, but we also, because we've been using them so much, um, I got to tell you, I, I worked at Kaiser over in Oakland and we had 60 of these devices uh, for 300 beds. And so um, to have the few that we have, we're beginning to 
um, use them more and more. And so it really helps to have these. We actually borrowed two of these six feet just recently from one of our sister hospitals. Um, and we're hoping to, to use these more and more as an adjunct therapy or actually precursor therapy, uh, like Dr. Curry heard, had alluded to, um, to keep the patient off the ventilators. There is one other question in the chat. It's, uh, does it introduce extra fluid into the lungs? No. 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 Again, the, 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 um, the temperature of the, uh, the tubing and the humidification basically matches that of the body. So when you're breathing normally, your nose and your mouth are your internal humidifiers. And so it keeps the temperature the same. And so it's basically not adding water into the lung. It, it's just taking that air and getting it humidified so that it can be delivered into the lower airway where it's absorbed. But the, there's no, because once it's in the body now, it, it stays that temperature, right? It, does, it doesn't rain out or condense once it's inside. That would be an external problem. Cool. And so I, how, how quickly uh, treatment team can patients go from room air to needing this high flow oxygen? How, what's the, you know, how rapid can that happen? Well, I think we've, we've seen a lot of a, a different trajectories, but you know, some of the worst cases that I've seen are patients who come in from home and they were on room air at home, not doing well. <laughs> they shouldn't have been on room air, but they came in on room air. We found their oxygen level to be very low and, and quickly within a day, they were at the point either we were gonna have to put them on a ventilator or use something like this. Yeah, Dan. Another question for you. Um, so, I mean, I, I see it as not just a COVID solution. I mean, it seems like it'll be a solution for other respiratory issues long-term. I mean, it seems like it's way more successful than the other mask that would be over your face, uh, more comfortable for the patient, probably more successful long-term. I mean, do you see it pretty much migrating to this type of apparatus in the future for all sorts of respiratory challenges? Absolutely. In fact, before COVID, um, you know, many of us used it a lot. As I mentioned, um, you know, my first introduction to it um, you know, started out at uh, Altabate Summit, the Ashby campus in Berkeley. They have a very, uh, very active neonatal unit, and it was pivotal in certain you know, premature infant survivability. And once the technology was expanded to include adults, you know, because we had those machines there, we adult doctors said, hey, get me that because I can avoid intubation. So, you know, we certainly used it in those patients who had lung diseases that required they be on a lot of oxygen, but didn't have problems with um, carbon dioxide retention in particular, which sometimes the two go hand in hand. And, and so we were able in many cases to avoid putting the people on BiPAP or, or a, a ventilator. So you're absolutely right. There is a huge uh, uh, application for this that I think going forward when we, I'm just not gonna say hopefully, when we get you know, over this COVID nonsense, when we get beyond that, I bet we will be using it far more in general because of exactly these features that, and, and not everybody was familiar with it. I think those of us in pulmonology, maybe we had a little head start on it, um, but it quickly has been um, embraced by our ER colleagues and our hospitalist colleagues, and, and now they're more familiar. So I, I anticipate we'll be seeing a lot more use and hopefully we'll have the opportunity to secure in the future equipment you know, maybe even replace out some of our ventilators because we want to use these more. Wouldn't that be lovely? Cool. Any other questions on uh, the unit? And it's not closed out, uh, but I think you can see what I'm 
huge impact you've made on our ability to help patients. Um, you know, Dr. Carey said when we're over this, uh, I think you said nonsense. Is that what you said? <laughs> <laughs> it is nonsense. The uh, virus. On that note, uh, <laughs> let me pivot to uh, Dr. Veronique Gal, who is our chief medical executive here at Eden. Uh, she's an emergency room physician by background, and uh, she's going to talk about our vaccination efforts here uh, within the hospital. And then uh, she'll introduce Dr. Lynn to talk about his work uh, through the Medical Foundation. Veronique? Yeah, thank you. So fortunately, we do have two great options for vaccines, both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. We rolled that out um, in mid-December to healthcare providers as, as directed by the city and county who supplied a great deal of our, our vaccine. Um, to date, we have 68% of Eden Medical Center's staff and physicians vaccinated. Um, we are continuing our vaccine clinic for our acute care providers um, through the end of February, but then we're, we're pivoting at that point to hand off to the um, outpatient uh, center network, at which Terrence Lynn will, will describe more and shortly. Um, what the vaccine has provided us, which um, honestly is above and beyond any PPE um, that could manage, is just hope. It's hope that we have um, a little bit more of a grasp around this virus that, that we were learning so much about in real time. And it's hope that we will get to the other side of this quote nonsense <laughs> very soon. So, um, but, this, but I wanna make sure that everyone on this call is very well aware. Just because when and if you, you do get vaccinated, it doesn't mean you stop social distancing. It doesn't mean you stop wearing a mask. It doesn't mean you stop doing the personal hygiene that you need to do because coronavirus is a very, very common virus. It is very easy to mutate. It is very contagious. And so just because you're vaccinated means that you're somewhat protected, but that doesn't necessarily protect all those around you. So um, please, please stay vigilant. We are not out of the woods. I would be very surprised if we were out of the woods in 2021, but we're moving in that direction, which is really, really great. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to uh, Dr. Terrence Lynn. Dr. Terrence Lynn is an interventional cardiologist with Palo Alto Medical Foundation, both at the Dublin and Fremont clinics. And he's also the East Bay Geographic Medical Director who's helping to lead the efforts of getting vaccine out into our community. So Dr. Lynn. Thank you. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Fantastic. Um, I think there's no good meeting without a PowerPoint. So here it comes. <laughs> so. Um, Thanks everybody for having me today. Um, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about our outpatient vaccine efforts, uh, sort of uh, in conjunction with our hospital and our, uh, and our Sutter network. Uh, next slide. This is a great number. We've given over uh, 150,000. If we just pause for a few seconds, somebody just got another one. Um, it's an ongoing number. Um, and I think that uh, some of the challenges uh, with a large scale vaccination program and I'm sure Rotary will know about this. Uh, it's, this one is unique because it, uh, our current vaccines are a two dose vaccine. So it's not enough to just give the shot and say, hooray, we have to give the shot and we're committed to giving the second shot to the people uh, for maximal effectiveness. This, and you will have heard about this in the news is um, limited by uh, receipt of the vaccine, the logistics of uh, administering it both by location and as well as keeping uh, the site and uh, distribution safe. Uh, we maintain our social distancing when we're giving these shots. We monitor our patients afterwards. We know that there's a, it's a very safe vaccine. We know that um, 15 minutes out, almost nothing happens, but we like to watch for that 15 minutes to make sure um, people don't have the things that they get with shots. Some people pass out now and again because they don't like needles and we're aware of that and that should not uh, be a hesitation in receiving a vaccine. So next slide. Um, tiering, so we are going by the CDC guidelines. Um, and let me say, I, we watch the CDC guidelines very closely and we're in contact with both our county, state and national agencies. And I will tell you that the numbers change and the tiers have changed multiple times. Um, I will say that the uh, you've heard a lot of back and forth about the 75 plus and then the 65 plus, and I will tell you that it was 75 plus until the night before 
uh, the news release came out and then all of a sudden it was 65 plus. So there was some scrambling. Um, uh, for me, I like to take a long view. Everybody's going to get it. So, <laughs> and so I think uh, we want to focus our efforts sort of nationally and as, as uh, medical providers into getting the vaccine to our most at risk people. It does look like age is probably one of the strongest predictors of um, bad outcomes. And so that 75 plus um, group is higher risk than the 65 uh, plus. Um, tiering, uh, people will say uh, 1A, 1B, uh, 1B tier one and 1B tier two um, to make it as confusing as possible, but to have lots of number ones in there. Uh, 1A will be the healthcare personnel, long-term facility residents. By and large, most of that has been done already. We are definitely into the 1B tier one, which is 65 plus. Uh, the CDC recommends education, childcare, emergency service workers, and then essential food and agriculture workers. Um, when we release within these tiers from a logistics standpoint, I will say that 65 and older is open at most um, institutions that are administering vaccine for scheduling at least, and I know that we are giving those. Um, very shortly, I think uh, education, childcare, emergency services, all will roll in. Just to put things in perspective, we want to, again, make sure that the vaccine is accessible um, to sort of everyone equally. I think that um, I will also say, um, just as an anecdote, people lie. <laughs> so we do have funny things in the outpatient setting, people um, trying to squeeze the edges of what counts as um, delivering health care, including um, uh, stewardesses, uh, gym workers who might provide education and might have to do CPR on a plane in an emergency. Um, so we do see all of these things and logistically we expect it and, and plan around it. But I think that by and large, uh, we see a lot of excitement, of course, for the vaccine. Uh, I always, I'm an interventional cardiologist and let me say there are um, good days and bad days. I always thought it would be kind of nice to be an obstetrician because it's very happy all the time. But I will say that giving vaccine uh, feels a little bit like uh, being an obstetrician, uh, a lot of smiles all around. And then you're gonna wonder, how do I see the smiles without, with the masks on? It's because their eyes smile. Next slide. For the Sutter effort, um, it is a moving, um, uh, a moving target in terms of where and when and how many. We are doing real-time live scheduling. When we have appointments, we release them right away. Um, there are appointments, I'm going to say they're going to release some this afternoon, I'm pretty sure. Um, and so um, scheduling, you know, we're talking about administering vaccine to hundreds of thousands um, locally and millions of people. And I think that um, if you think about the logistics behind like a big concert or a sporting event, that's about 100,000 people. And it takes, you know, a year of planning easily for those things. Um, we have our most up-to-date vaccine information on our website. It's there, sutterhealth.org slash COVID vaccine. Um, there are phone numbers to call if anybody's ever called a call center or ticket master. Uh, when there's a big event and there's a lot of excitement, it's hard to get through. Um, I think the online scheduling works better right now. That's just my advice to people. So next. Um, here are our current Bay Area vaccine clinics. In our East Bay Area, we have um, four sites. As you see, we have two in the South Bay. We have two in the peninsula. Um, the Santa Cruz site we'll talk about in a little bit. And we have uh, four sites in San Francisco and the North Bay. Um, we are adding sites and we are um, partnering with um, local institutions. Um, and I think it's OK to say that we're um, participating in mass vaccination sites coming up soon. And there's um, um, obviously some logistic planning happening there, uh, but we are um, expanding our capacity rapidly. Within this current set, um, not counting the uh, San Mateo Event Center, which is a large site um, that's opening and the West Spring site, we have the capacity to give about 50,000 vaccines a week, pending what we receive. We are not actually receiving 50,000 vaccines a week from uh, from the state yet, um, though we anticipate that as we go forward, um, as vaccine production increases, we we're, uh, we have capacity to give more, I'll say. Next slide. 
this is a uh, just a slide of our Santa Cruz site. We have um, we own an old drive-in theater, which turns out to be perfect for both watching movies and giving vaccines um, as a flow. So um, this is just a, a couple of pictures of um, the uh, the pre-painted lines that turn out to be perfect for a one-way flow for a, a drive-in vaccine clinic. Um, so our Santa Cruz site, um, the first person vaccinated in Santa Cruz County was at our drive-in site, and I believe it was a, a community a dental worker, I believe. Um, the pictures below are the San Mateo Event Center. The building is now full with evenly spaced chairs, um, and they're administering vaccines, and this is one of our large sites uh, with increased capacity of uh, several thousand a day. Um, Next slide. Uh, I always think it's nice to have a um, sort of the human impact of what we're doing. Um, the first uh, picture, um, that's actually one of my nurses and there's no nepotism here. Actually, I, I, didn't, I didn't actually realize this happened until uh, uh, I believe Kathleen told me. So one of, uh, this is one of our nurses in cardiology. That is her mom who is a community pediatrician not affiliated with um, our foundation. But one of our, uh, our tenets of administering vaccines is to administer them to our community. Um, so she uh, sent this note of appreciation because we were able to vaccinate both her and her mom, um, which I thought was great. In our um, Castro Valley site, we had a grateful patient get their vaccine and they were so, um, speaking of the smiles and happiness, they were so grateful that they, um, they bought lunch, I believe for the entire uh, team uh, out at Castro Valley and it was, uh, both unexpected and appreciated and enjoyed uh, outdoors and socially distanced. Um, so that was, um, it's always a nice touch. I think that we always, we hear a lot of appreciation all the time. And, and sometimes these uh, tokens um, really help morale and really remind our staff uh, if they don't know already what a, a great thing they're doing. Um, the third is um, uh, our Dublin site. Also, we have a drive-in testing site as well as um, uh, a vaccine site planned. Um, so, you know, as Dr. Au was saying, one of the things that's great about the vaccine is it's like a little shot of hope, right? That, um, that the world maybe goes back a little bit closer to the way it was before. And, um, and I think one of the great things we see is sort of all hands on deck, you know, in terms of within our foundation, um, I would go so far as to say everybody's volunteering, everybody wants to be involved, everybody, um, uh, realizes both the importance of it and wants to help. So I think, uh, I think that's been great. Um, it reminds us, I think, a little bit of a lot of us why we went into medicine in the first place and sort of, sort of that stark, uh, that stark um, experience. Next slide. Um, here are our leaders participating on the left. This is like a grainy shot from the paparazzi, but uh, that is our Sutter Health President and CEO, Sarah Crevins, uh, helping out, um, I believe, at one of our Sacramento sites. And our Palo Medical Foundation um, President and CEO, Dr. Villardo, giving a lucky uh, patient his shot. Next slide. Um, I wanted to just mention one other thing. I think that, um, you know, certainly our providers appreciate the support from our community. We think it's important. We think that um, as we say, it's a community effort and we can't do it without our communities, both from the logistics of scheduling um, for our equipment. I think um, at our foundation sites, we were able to open very quickly a series of respiratory care clinic sites. Um, if I rewind one year, um, there was a lot of trepidation about bringing um, uh, patients with a respiratory illness into the clinic setting. These are closed buildings without... Um, um, they turn the air over more often than regular buildings, but still not enough to make people feel necessarily safe. So we instituted a series of outdoor clinics. And let me say, thank goodness um, for the uh, California weather <laughs> to be able to do something like that. Um, we did have a, a series of respiratory clinics. One of the things that we um, were able to do um, with the help of a philanthropic grant was to buy actually oxygen sensors um, to use both to deploy to some of our patients and then to use in the clinics to measure uh, the oxygen to see if they would need those high flow units at Castro Valley. Um, so I think that that's been uh, a great example of something that we know what to do. We know how to do it and our part, our community partners helping join in to allow us to both to execute and take care of our patients together. So 
I thank you for uh, your time. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. I have a question. Um, one, do you have suggestions for how Rotarians or other community members can really help and lean into this at this point? I, I was reminded that when you showed the Santa Cruz vaccination facilities, that a week or, or so ago, a fellow Rotarian from the Santa Cruz Sunrise was not available for a Friday afternoon meeting because he was helping at a vaccination site. Yeah. And I thought, I wonder if those opportunities are available for us here in Area 4 amongst our uh, Tri-Valley and out to Castro Valley and Hayward uh, for us to pitch in. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that um, in terms of sort of the physical volunteering portion, um, I will say that the most likely opportunity um, will be at um, the joint mass vaccination sites is my guess from a logistics standpoint. Um, those are gonna be coordinated in conjunction right now with both Sutter Health as well as Stanford Healthcare and um, the county. Um, I think they are actually uh, talking about putting out a call for volunteers soon. And certainly I think that's gonna be uh, one of the opportunities. And let me say, you will have plenty of time to volunteer because even with mass vaccination sites, this is, a, this is a prolonged marathon, not a sprint. So I think that, let me just say that my opinion is there is always a lot of excitement up front. Um, that excitement tails off, and that's where I think that people will have the most impact. Um, Midsummer, when it's hot outside, um, into the fall, when you know hopefully schools are open, some of those volunteers go away, and I think that we will still be doing. Um, just when I count the numbers and do the math of how many vaccines need to be administered, I think we'll still be do, um, doing it. So I think that that um, I think that's going to be the most likely. Um, sort of in-person volunteering kind of opportunity. Certainly, I think that um, the fundraising for the high flow units um, is fantastic. I think that um, when we think about um, philanthropy and what that's able to do, it allows us to accelerate our care and it allows us to um, execute some of the ideas. There are a lot of smart people full of great ideas. And um, let, let's just be honest about the world. Um, Rotarians will know that the world is resource constrained, right? So I think that sometimes having um, uh, the ability to accelerate programs as with the high flow oxygen program, I think those opportunities are, are certainly, um, they have a lot of impact, so. Thank you very much. Other thoughts, questions, comments, uh, was this helpful? Well, I'll say I think it was terrific. So thanks very much. I really appreciated all the great information. I will add one thing on a sort of personal note here is uh, too for uh, Chris, so that uh, my wife is the uh, charge nurse in that NICU at all debates. And I'm sure she's gonna be thrilled to hear that uh, the idea for these things sort of came from that experience that you had up there. So, uh, but this is a great explanation. So thanks so much. Uh, we, Really appreciate that again to everybody and to Pat and all the team for putting the grant together and everything. There are two Pats here, so there are two Pats to thank. Right. Uh, that one. <laughs> <laughs> but we thank you both. Well, well look, I'm... we appreciate the partnership with you, and um, we can't thank you enough, frankly. Well, let's, let's keep it going here. We'll have to think of something else to do now. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much for the time of all the Eden staff and, and, and for you taking the time to really spin us up on what is an exciting development, uh, the, the use of this technology, how it came out of, uh, where it came out of with your preemie babies and, and then being able to see it extended to these uses and in response to Dan's comments that it's, you see lots more opportunities. So, and, and also just to give us a flavor of what it's been like for you to deal with this while well, we've been hunkered down at home for the most part you guys have been on the front lines we really really appreciate that well we will share that with our staff for sure um, and we do whenever we get a letter or a compliment like this uh, we also uh, share it with them uh, and um, we were able to get some uh, finally some nurses from out of town travelers who are vetted and are superstars uh, to come in and uh, hopefully give our own staff a break and uh, take some time off. 
So, uh, so they need to replenish and re resuscitate themselves in some way, spiritually, emotionally. So thank you. Uh, knowing you're behind us and uh, might even be in front of us with volunteering on the uh, vaccination side, uh, uh, we, we thank you. All right, is there, is there more that anybody needs to, I, I don't wanna cut anybody off here, but I do wanna be sensitive to the time of these working, working medical professionals. And thank you, Kathleen, for getting us together so much. You. Thank you all. Bye-bye. All. all right. We'll, we'll wrap it up then. Bye, and thanks again to all. Take care. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Be safe.